Hi, Andre Bester here, and you're joining me on This Is What We Were Told. The Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 27 that God created man in his own image. I've always been rather curious about what exactly it meant to be created in the image of God. From the sound of it, being created in the image of God somehow seems to separate us from other life forms. The rest of creation was not created in the image of God. It was just created. However, we humans were very explicitly created in the image of God. Today I'd like to talk about the meaning of being created in the image of God. I always thought that being created in the image of God meant that we looked like God. After all, the word image carries with it the idea of a visual representation. But then, as I grew a little older and wiser, I realized that we humans all look different from one another. Therefore, the meaning of this phrase then probably ran a bit deeper than I initially anticipated. Being a believer made this riddle somewhat easier for me to deal with. Nothing requires of me to have an analyzed understanding of this phrase, just as long as I believe it. After all, how difficult can it be to say, I believe it? I suspect that the concept of being created in the image of God is a matter that many believers either do not regard as important to understand or too difficult to understand. Either way, I think many settle the matter by convincing themselves that I believe I'm created in the image of God and that is good enough for me. It's really easy to opt for this route. It requires no cognitive effort from my side. It's written there in the Bible and I can simply accept it as truth. But it becomes a very different picture when one starts pondering on what lies at the heart of the things in which you believe or used to believe. When you no longer simply take things at face value but instead seek to understand what informed your faith. That is when questions like what it means to be created in the image of God become really important. This is supposed to feed faith. So how must we understand this in a way that will bolster faith? Being created in the image of God could potentially mean any number of things. The word image suggests the action of seeing is the basis of how we should understand this phrase. But even the act of seeing could have various meanings. It could, for example, mean that I am seeing something with my physical eyes, or that I'm forming an opinion in my mind regarding something. So, if we are to understand that image is a word that could either indicate something physical in form, or a concept that is immaterial in nature, then we are actually faced with several possible meanings of this phrase. Let's explore. It could mean that I literally look like God and He like me. Or I have physical attributes similar to God's. Or I have basic morphological attributes similar to God. Or I think and reason like God. Or, I have God's sense of morality. Or, I have the same emotions as God. Or, I am of exactly the same spirit as God. Or, I share any combination of these attributes with God. Or, I share all of these attributes with God. I listed all the things I could think of that could possibly remind us of God. At least one of these things should be able to put us in mind of God when we look at another human being, right? In other words, when I look at another person, I should be able to point to 
at least one of these attributes that I've listed here and, and say this or that makes me recognize the image of God. Correct? But before you agree with me, let's first carefully consider the full extent and implications of each of these possibilities. Does it mean that I literally look like God and He like me? My common sense tells me the answer to this question is no. I'm a human, but I'm only one of billions of other humans. Not a single one of us looks exactly the same, except maybe identical twins. We all come in different shapes, sizes and appearances. If it were true that I literally looked like God, it would imply that everyone else did not look like God. Of course, this would mean that I would be the only human who had been created in the image of God, nobody else. Somehow I don't think this will sit well with other believers. But hang on a bit. Genesis 1 verse 27 says that God created male and female in His image. Does that mean that both Adam and Eve looked exactly like God and He like them? Mm, no. Otherwise there would not have been any difference between male and female now, would there? It is clear, being created in the image of God does not mean that I literally look like God and He like me. Does it mean that I have physical attributes similar to God's? Sounds plausible, doesn't it? Let's explore. When I talk about having physical attributes similar to God's, I'm saying that God has given us a body, a head, arms, hands, legs and feet, just like He has. Easy enough thus far. But at some point we will have to acknowledge human physical attributes that are a bit more challenging. Humanity is made up of various races, each with their own physical attributes. And as is the case with the rest of the animal kingdom, we distinguish between two sexes, male and female. I'm not now referring to gender, but to a person's DNA assigned sex. Race and sex make us look fundamentally different from one another. Obviously, at the core, we're all 100% human. But the problem is that these differences could potentially make it very difficult to know which physical attributes actually link us to the image of God and which do not. If we say that we share all our physical attributes with God, we're going to face a problem. The differences amongst us are going to lead to the inevitable conclusion that some of us are going to be in the image of God, whilst the rest of us will not be. It's all going to depend on whether God is male or female, and whether He is African Black, Caucasian, Oriental, Hispanic or Indian. This idea sounds to me rather dead in the water. But just to drive the point home, if being created in the image of God means we all have the same physical attributes as God, does it mean that He also has sexual parts? What about a belly button? Does He have growing hair and nails? Does he have bodily functions like we do? It sounds a bit ridiculous to ascribe such attributes to a God, doesn't it? After all, a God is a God because he is not like a human. So if we then only share some physical attributes with God, which are those? How can we know? If it's not possible to know, how could the authors of Genesis then state that we have been created in the image of God? Somehow it doesn't seem to me as though being created in the image of God relates to our physical attributes. Could it perhaps mean that we have basic morphological attributes similar to God? Let's examine. When I talk about basic morphological attributes, I'm talking about bipedalism. 
In other words, walking on two legs. An upright body posture and gait. Having one head with a forward-looking face, one torso, two arms, two hands, two legs and two feet with external body parts symmetrically arranged. This is the basic morphological plan of a human, right? But wait a minute, this is also the basic morphological plan of the big apes. I concede of all the primates, humankind is the only one that is exclusively bipedal. However, the skeletal plan of the big apes is suited well enough to allow for bipedal as well as quadrupedal mobility. There's no denying. We share the same basic morphological plan with a lot of primates, in particular the big apes, in quite a few very obvious respects. Think about basic skeletal structure, specifically our skulls, spinal cords, rib cages, pelvises, arms, hands and legs. Now let's add to this our mobility, widespread use of tools, basic diet, social structures and interaction, the importance of social belonging, recognition and acceptance, the important role of physical touch, the expression of emotions and basic instincts like maternal love and care. The similarities are plainly striking and emotionally stirring. Of course, for a proponent of evolution by natural selection, these similarities come as no surprise. We have these similarities because of shared ancestry. It's almost inevitable that there should be similarities between us. In contrast, for a proponent of intelligent design, in other words, creationism, these similarities can be nothing more than coincidental. It can be nothing else than coincidental freedom of design by the designer, God. Regardless of how you attempt to explain the similarities, in answering the question at hand, these similarities can only lead us to one of the following conclusions. Either all of the big apes are created in the image of God, or being created in the image of God does not have anything to do with our basic morphological attributes. I don't think there is any reasonable prospect of any believer soon settling on the idea that all big apes are created in the image of God. That leaves me with the inevitable conclusion that being created in the image of God does not have anything to do with our basic morphological attributes. Does it mean that I reason and think like God? That sounds like a possibility, doesn't it? After all, we are clever enough to probe the furthest reaches of outer space. We study the behavior of the most elusive building blocks of atoms. We have a sense of morality, responsibility and ethics. That certainly sets us apart from all the animals, doesn't it? Of course it does. But that's not the ultimate test. The ultimate test is whether our reasoning capabilities are a reflection of God's. And the answer to this test is an easy no. The Bible abounds in references to the effect that our human minds are far too simple to comprehend the might, glory, sovereignty, pureness, omnipotence and holiness of God. According to the Bible, we dare not question God's decisions and His works because His thoughts are perfect, holy and immutable. In our frailty, we are simply incapable of seeing the bigger picture and understanding the higher purpose of God's divine plans. Our thoughts supposedly are far inferior to God's. There should be little disagreement. To be created in the image of God has nothing to do with our cognitive and abstract thinking capabilities. What about our sense of morality? Surely that is a reflection of the image of God, eh? 
After all, Christianity makes a point of it that it was God and His laws that taught us morality. Yes, this sounds like it. Sadly, no, it's not going to fly. You see, humankind has been around much longer than any religion or God book. We've been determining our own morality for over a hundred thousand years before any of the gods of the modern world made their appearance. I have no doubt that God books like the Bible would have influenced a lot of people's conceptualization of morality. But this would only be true for the last two or three thousand years of our existence. To say that we got our sense of morality from God is going too far and is simply not true. After all, will we suddenly start killing, stealing and raping if we were to discover that the Bible was wrong after all? No, of course not. We will continue conducting ourselves in an orderly fashion. We determine our morals ourselves and those morals are essentially based on how we would want other people to treat us. Besides, according to the Bible in Romans 3, we are so morally corrupt that we all fall short of the glory of God. No, this does not bode well for the idea that our sense of morality is reflective of the image of God. Oh, but wait a minute. Maybe being created in the image of God has something to do with the sinless state in which Adam and Eve were before the fall of man. That could be it. Oh, shucks, but wait. That would mean that everybody born after the fall of man were not created in the image of God. Hmm. And we still sit with that pesky Romans 3 problem. No, it seems our sense of morality does not have anything to do with the image of God. But could it mean that I have the same emotions as God? There are quite a few texts in the Bible where we get a glimpse into God's own emotional disposition. God has expressed satisfaction, rage, disappointment, joy, jealousy, and even sadness. So it is possible that we have this characteristic in common with God. But then we must concede that the ability to express and experience emotions is not something unique to God and humans. All animals with a level of intelligence display emotions. And this is not some wild guess, it's pretty obvious. We all experience happiness, sadness, despondency, jealousy, rage, joy, contentment, boredom, disappointment and longing. Emotion can tell others so much about our state of mind, even when we're not saying out loud what we're feeling. Emotion can also reveal a lot about our own inner strength. So much so that I think some believers will prefer God to be above certain emotions. Just think, for example, about emotions that might attest to vulnerability or weakness. For example, fear, uncertainty, pessimism or suspicion. Does God have these emotions? I guess not, otherwise he might appear limited in his abilities. So even on an emotional level, it does not seem as though we've been created in the image of God. Does it mean that I am of the same spirit as God? The answer to this question is not as obvious as believers might think. What does spirit mean? In all my time as a believer, I've heard the most inventive explanations of how humans have a body, soul, and spirit. How each of these have a unique characteristic and function, completely distinguishable from the others. None of this has ever made any sense to me. In my own mind, I always reasoned that I have a physical body that is perishable, and then there is the real me the spirit being who inhabits this perishable body, who is conscious, who thinks and reasons, who experiences life 
and feels and expresses emotion. Never has any explanation of the difference between spirit and soul made any logical sense to me. But knowing the difference does not seem of any use in dealing with our question. What does seem important is that my spirit is the essence of my life and it comes from God. This seems to me to be a key principle. My spirit came into existence when I came into existence. Apparently it is eternal in nature and is autonomously alive. Now this is a very interesting thought. It tells me that the real me does not require a physical body to remain alive. In my current state of aliveness, my physical body supposedly is merely a temporary dwelling for my spirit. In this way, my spirit is bound to my physical body and this bond apparently is severed when my physical body dies. Now, if this is true, then I really don't understand why it should be necessary for us to have physical bodies, when the real us are spiritual beings? Or am I missing something here? Never mind, for the sake of argument, I'll accept for now that the real me is a spirit, housed in a perishable physical body. So when my physical body dies, my spirit, the real me, is set free and continues to live whilst my physical body decays. My spirit continues to be conscious, self-aware, cognitively engaged and integrated in a community of fellow spirits who are equally connected to one another and their spirit world surroundings. My spirit continues to express and feel emotion. In short, my spirit continues as if I've never died. In fact, I think it experiences aliveness more intensely because it has been freed from the shackles of my imperfect physical body. Now, if this is anywhere near close to an accurate description of what my spirit is, I think we should already be experiencing a good part of this perfect state of immortality in our present lives. After all, the real us are spirits, and these spirits are already alive in this present world. Let me explain. If it is true that my spirit, the real me, does not need a physical body to remain completely alive and conscious, my spirit should continue feeling alive and fully conscious even if my physical body were disengaged. How does my physical body become disengaged? Simple examples. Sleep or undergoing general anesthesia. When my physical body is disengaged through sleep or general anesthetic or even a massive blow to the head, I expect that my spirit should remain fully conscious and functional without skipping a beat. The real me should be aware of the spirit world alive all around me. The only problem is this. I've never had this kind of experience when asleep, nor when I received general anesthesia. In fact, I fairly recently underwent general anesthesia for a surgical procedure. Alas, no out-of-body experience. In all instances where my physical body was disengaged, the real me was also very much disengaged. The real me has never been in a situation where it was able to function or remain conscious without my physical body. It turns out the real me is very much dependent on my physical body remaining alive and functional. This forces me to conclude that a lot of people's conceptualization of the nature of spirit is flawed and invalid. According to the Bible, God does not have a physical body. God is spirit and he exists independently of a physical body. The human condition is very different in the sense that even though a lot of us want to believe that we are spirit in nature, 
We are all very much dependent on our physical bodies to remain alive. None of us has ever had the actual experience that we remain alive when our physical bodies become incapacitated. As a matter of fact, on a very granular and fundamental level, the real me turns out to be nothing more than a brain. A wonderful electronic processor linked up to a set of very handy applications. For example, our five senses. This allows the processor to experience and interpret emotions, feel physical stimuli, have preferences and unique character traits. No two persons processor connections are the same, thus allowing for a rich blend of personalities, characters and deviancies. The real us cannot survive without physical bodies. We are indeed perishable and temporary. When we die, there is nothing to continue. Processing of electronic impulses stops, memory stops, and time jerks to a standstill. We are not of the same spirit as God. Of all the possible explanations of what it means to be created in the image of God, Nothing seems to offer any reasonable and logical solution that could explain how we look like God or possess some or other characteristic of God. Not only do we not display any of these attributes in one or other combination, we do not display any of them. I fail to see how we are created in the image of God. Do you maybe know of anything that I might be missing? Please let me know in the comments. Friends on this channel, I talk about issues of faith and religion that seriously challenged my belief in the integrity of the Bible. In 2020, I published a book on my spiritual journey called This is What We Were Told. My book is aimed at challenging people to dare to look beyond the limitations of religious belief and to take in the bigger picture of the wonder of life. I provide some food for thought for others who might be finding themselves in a spiritual dead end and who are searching for a more meaningful understanding of the world in which we live. On this channel, I'm giving viewers a taste of the topics I cover in my book. On this channel and through my book, I aim to awaken people to the wonders of life playing out right around us, just beyond the boundaries of faith. If you're interested in a copy of my book, mail me at the address on the screen and I'll be in touch. Have a lovely day.